Good morning. We'll just do that again, just in case. Good morning. Good morning. There you go. Nice. Nice to see that you're awake. All right. Well, happy resurrection morning to you. Thank you. I am glad someone resurrected today. This is good. Excuse me? Well, thank you. Thank you, yes. I do this just to keep you all guessing. So somewhere around Christmas time, somewhere around Resurrection Day, I'll wear a suit and tie just to keep you guessing. We are going to continue on in John chapter 12. It, It fits perfectly and I mean, most of us have probably been in church on the day of the, uh, that we commemorate the resurrection, and so um, it, it's fitting and it's it's perfect that we are here continuing on as we have. This is actually week number 60, if you could imagine that, in the Gospel of John. And to recognize where we are in the text, it's just it's so appropriate, so perfect. Um, if you came in a little bit late, you'll know that we didn't do the bulletin, so we're not going to do that now. We're not going to take an offering. You can take care of that in the back. There's a box as you exit if you want to do that, if you were wondering. Um, John chapter 12 is where we're going to uh, be at in our text this morning. It begins at verse 20. And so I'm going to ask you to turn there and then keep your finger on that chapter, but then also turn to Luke chapter 18 with me. I just want to begin there. And be reminded of something that Jesus did, because we oftentimes will look at the whole series or the whole sequence, if you will, of events of this week and what they represent. And from an earthly perspective, we might think, wrong place, wrong time. And poor Jesus, if only this or that had happened, if only things had happened a little bit differently. But we want to make sure that we recognize how deliberate all of these things were, not only from Jesus' perspective, but you'll also notice from someone after the events, the speaking about it is such a deliberate act. And that's what I want to focus on this morning, if we can. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you as we gather in this place, as we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, recognizing that had that not taken place, all the other events of the week would have meant nothing. We thank you that at the appointed time, of all the weeks in all of human history, from the beginning of when you spoke the universe into existence, that week, the events of that week, have shaped eternity and the ripples will be felt forever. We thank you that you gather us here today, that we can come to your word and know and be led by your truth from your word. We thank you for the Holy Spirit who works in us to make these things understandable. We pray that you would glorify yourself in this place today, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Chapter 18 of Luke's Gospel, at verse 31, I want to remind us that before this time, as they were on their way to Jerusalem, it is not as though Jesus had not already told them of the events. But I want us to recognize that even as we will look at what is in the text before us, the anxiousness, and imagine being one of the people who had followed him around and listened to the things that he had said over and over and over again, even though he had warned them and told them that these things would be taking place, I suppose being in the thick of it at that time, the panic that must have taken place, and then the despair. We were talking Friday night at my house. There were some friends that were over, and every once in a while it it always is helpful to us to pause for just a moment and think on that Friday night at the time of the Passover as they would be doing during the Sabbath time, as they would be gathered in those houses, the events of the day would be surreal to them. Very real people with very real emotions were thinking of all the things that we saw Jesus do. He died today. And then, is it true what we had been told? Will he resurrect? Will he come back to life? Did they even have the presence of mind to ask the questions? But the defeat that that I'm sure that that must have felt like to them, to see those things actually happen right in front of them, and then the uncertainty of what comes next. I mean, it is easy to forget that there are real people at the time having to go through the things that they saw, and then all of the wondering of what would take place. Well, here, they were troubled by the the journey, if you will, and the, 
the deliberate nature of Jesus as he walked on their way to Jerusalem for that last time before the triumphal entry. At verse 31 of Luke 18, we read this. Then he took the twelve aside and he said to them, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem. And all the things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man, they will be accomplished. For he will be delivered to the Gentiles. They will mock him and insult him and spit upon him. They will scourge him and kill him. And then on the third day, rise again. But they understood none of these things. This saying was hidden from them, and they did not know the things which were spoken. Now this is Luke writing this for us. This is Luke writing about the events long after they had taken place. And it is Luke's narrative here that said, even though Jesus had told them these things before, and once again warns them, these things were hidden from their eyes, or at least for a time. It was only going to be a short amount of time before they would see him come into the, uh, the place at triumphal entry, as we looked at last Sunday. They would see him be put to death right before the, the, uh, the Sabbath was to end at Passover, and then they would also know that he had resurrected. And Luke writes about these things after the fact. Now to John chapter 12. And if I may, let me do a very quick reset of the week, because there is a great importance to it. The day that he comes in, what we looked at last Sunday, the triumphal entry, it had to be that day. Now, why did it have to be that day? Because Daniel chapter 9, verse 25 said so. The way that he would enter into the city, his mode of transportation, if you will, was told, about us, or told to us in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, as we looked at last week. Also, if you know the things that were being said and reasoning behind it is found in... Psalm 118 at verse 22 to 26. So the things that were being said, the way that he came in, on the day that he was supposed to, and for the reasons that he did, were all prophesied. So if he does not come in on that day, and if he does not do so in the way that he did, and the people don't say the things that they said, then there is a failure in the scripture, and so the whole thing begins to disintegrate. But all the things happened just as they were supposed to. It was deliberate. And then we come forward to the day of the Passover and the sacrifice at Sabbath. And so we know that Jesus was presented as the Passover lamb that takes away the sin of the world. Again, as the scripture would tell us, he was perfect, without spot, without blemish. And in this case, it was God making the sacrifice on behalf of man and not man sacrificing before God for sin. And so he's given on Friday. And so we understand that he had to be put to death as he was. He had said that it would take place. He told them, you see right here, we've just read one of the number of places that you can take that. But you also know that it was going to be done the way that it was done, and that was in fulfillment of Psalm 22, even what he said as he cried out at the cross. Or Isaiah 53, that gives you all the reasons why. All of these Old Testament evidences, and again, everything had to be as it was. Now, if he does not die at the cross and he finds some other way, then there is no atonement. For the sin of mankind, because it is by the shedding of blood that atonement is made, all the way back in the book of Leviticus. So every bit of this, I'm hoping that just by throwing out these bits and pieces, you recognize how deliberate this was. Now, Peter is going to say as much as we get to something that he says a little bit later on as we study this and examine it this morning. But now, if he dies but does not resurrect, then he's just another would-be Messiah or somebody who would say so. He's either delusional or he's a liar. And then he stays in the grave and then we're not even here. We would have no reason to be together if that was the last part of it. It is the resurrection which was the culmination of the, of the week. The day that he came in, why he came in, exactly when he was supposed to, all of it was taken care of a week ago. The idea that he would be put to death and the reasons why was taken care of on Friday. But he crushed death this day as we commemorate it. On the day that he rose, and again, you know, we're not, we're not talking about an actual commemoration. This is not a literal calendar day remembrance. This is a remembrance of the event. And so by raising from the dead, he had now power over life and death, making good on all of the promises that he had given to us to say that if he lives, so will we. So as we take all of these things into account, I want to make sure that we understand the deliberate nature of this. 
Now, of course, we have just looked at last week him coming in, and as God set it up, after 59 weeks, we show up here on a Sunday morning to talk about the triumphal entry, and that's exactly where we were in the text last week. Those things worked out perfectly. So what about week number 60? Well, chapter 12 of John at verse 20 It says, now there were certain Greeks among those who came up to worship at the feast. And so they came to Philip, who was from Bethesda, or um, Bethsaida rather, of Galilee, and asked him, saying, sir, we wish to see Jesus. Now Philip uh, came and he told Andrew, and in turn Andrew and Philip told Jesus. Now there are people who would think that because of Jesus' reply, he gives the impression that he's kind of ignoring them. And yet, it's, it would seem it, the indication from the text, but more importantly, the way that Jesus would never shy away from answering a person who seeks, says this in the midst of a multitude of people. It's clear from the context that he says it so that all can hear because the Father is going to also attest to these things. So I would believe that these people who asked this question, Wanting a private audience, rather, Jesus makes it to the multitude. And verse 23 tells us, And so Jesus answered them, and he said, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Now, if we were to go back and look at all the times in all of the Gospels, when people would try to get him to do something, and he would say, My hour has not yet come, remember that was said to Mary in the first of all of the miracles that he did at Canaan. But then there are a number of other times when, it, when the Bible would tell us that either the hour had not yet come or his time had not yet come. You see that in chapter 7 and chapter 8 of this very same gospel where the people, the authorities, the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin, the Sadducees, the people, the councils wanted to take him by force, but it said his hour had not yet come. Therefore, they were powerless to do so. So remember that at all those times when the desire of man was to grab him, apprehend him, imprison him, or even put him to death, that time had not yet come because ultimately God was in charge of when that time would be. Now notice the transition in this. And it is from Jesus' own words. Look, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. So man had their plans They all came to nothing until Jesus said, now is the time. Now is the appointed time. So he says, most assuredly I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone, but if it dies, it produces much grain. Now this is an important thing that he says here, because now he explains why the time was necessary and why it had come to pass. And he begins to tell them and gives them a picture here that unless something dies like a grain, and remember, when they go to plant these things, they are taking grain from the the previous harvest. And that grain, if you will, as you look at it, is not doing much of anything. However, once it is put into the ground and it sprouts, then it brings forth fruit, it brings forth the harvest. So who is being referred to here? By Jesus being put into the the grave as though dead and resurrecting, the fruit that comes of, of that is not for his sake. It is for us. It is because he has died and come back to life that he can offer that life in turn to man. So if that was all that was being spoken of is that he is going to resurrect, that's great. I'm glad that he did. But if it has no benefit in the spiritual sense of eternity to us, what does it matter? We have no hope in this life other than that. And so he says, he begins to paint this picture for them. Now he says this, So he who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it unto eternal life. So he begins to speak about spiritual matters, though they are thinking in the physical sense. And once again, we are here because of a physical resurrection of Jesus. However, that physical resurrection is what has brought about the potential for life eternal in the spiritual sense, because you cannot remove one from the other. They are interconnected. And then verse 26 tells us, Now if anyone serves me, then let him follow me, that where I am, there my servant will be also. And if anyone serves me, uh, him my father will honor. Now here's one of the questions. When you read that in verse 26, If anyone serves me, let him follow me, that where I am, that my servant will be also. Every person who reads that 
has to recognize this idea of servanthood. It's not something that you're drafted into. It's something that is voluntary. And then you have to ask yourself, is, is it really a, a reality? Do I want to be where he is? Now, of course, we don't take those matters into our own hands. But in that eventuality, when I breathe my last, or however it is that I see him face to face, have I awaited this? Is this something that I have longed for? Do I recognize that it's even a potential because he has given himself for me? Is it something that I desire? Or is it something that is just written about in a book? Because in verse 27, he says this. Now my soul is troubled. And so what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? Do you ever really stop to consider that, yes, Jesus has already told his disciples, we are going to Jerusalem. I am going to be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be put to death, and then resurrected on the third day. He knows exactly what's happening, so why be troubled? Because there was a real cost to this in the physical sense. Did he feel these things? Absolutely. And part of that weight, I believe, though you can't prove it from the text, is him knowing that he's going to go through all of the steps of this sacrifice, and yet some will not take the opportunity to reach out to him and say, thank you for giving yourself for me, that I might be saved. There's a weight to that as well, to realize he is dying for the sin of mankind, and some people will look at everything that he has done and still not take the free gift of salvation. How difficult is it that he could have to come to that understanding. So he says, should I say, Father, save me from this hour? Listen to this and please, please take this to heart and recognize what he says here. But for this purpose, I have come to this hour. This is a pivot point in all of human history. The events of this week in sequence, all together, is the heaven and hell issue of all of eternity. He has come to this hour. Do I want to escape it, Jesus says? In the physical sense, I'm sure. Because he prayed that in the garden, did he not? If this cup can pass from me. If there is another way, nevertheless, Father, your will be done. Right here, look at what he says. My soul is troubled. So what should I say? Father, save me from this hour. This is the purpose that I've come to this hour. What a paradox. I'm troubled. I would love to see another way possible if this cup could pass and all the rest. And he says, but it is for this reason. Now, a number of people will look and they will say, in fact, we're always told by the people trying to puff up our self-esteem, you're made for a specific thing. You're made for greatness. We're hearing all the motivational speakers and some of them, unfortunately, in the church telling us all this stuff, filling our head with all kinds of nonsense. Look, there was one person in all of human history that was destined for one thing, and that was Jesus. He's the only person who was ever born expressly for one reason and one reason only, and that was to die on a cross. So from the moment that he breathed his first, it was looking to the moment that he would breathe his, breathe his last. Though he has always been and always will be, he confined himself to a body of flesh and blood, and here it is, all spoken of right here. It is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, now... Verse 28, glorify your name. Listen to this. So then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and I will glorify it again. So what was going to take place? This is not the first time that the Father has spoken in the hearing of all the people that are there. This, is, this has happened before, that the Father would speak audibly. It happened at his baptism and it will happen again even after this time, that the Father will speak. So he says, I have glorified it, not only by saying what I've said, but by the signs and, if you will, the wonders, the things that had happened, the miraculous things. Jesus would say over and over again in this gospel, the things that you have seen, the miracles, the signs and the wonders, they testify of the truthfulness of what I've been saying. So it's one thing to say something, and then it is another to have miraculous things accompany those, giving credibility to the claims. And so the Father says, I have been glorifying it all along and I will glorify it again. Resurrecting him from the dead. The work that takes place after that. When he is ascended and the voice that will come. All of those things. Amazing how this is the Father attesting. And then notice, we will look at this next week. Therefore the people who stood by and heard it said it thundered. They noticed, they recognized it. And Jesus will explain the context of why they just heard what they heard. 
So as we take all of this in, before we go to our next of the texts, from Luke's perspective at the beginning of telling us what Jesus had said and giving us a little bit of his narrative, and then John here, once again, writing after the event, some 60 years roughly, telling us of the things that had taken place and the deliberate nature of all of them. You're assembled here, and maybe some of you, you don't attend very often. Maybe your family brought you or, or whatever it is that's brought you to this place. If you've never had a chance to look at it kind of in its sequence, in its chronology, it is very important that we recognize that what is spoken about in this week, and let's face it, if we were to back up the clock, the events of that week would not parallel where we are in our calendar 2017. There's no question about that. But people that get all caught up in what day are you doing this and all the rest of it miss the big picture. The big picture is that Jesus came into Jerusalem for the purpose that he did on the day that he was supposed to, just as the scripture said so. He was put to death for the reasons that he was put to death in the way that he was supposed to. All of those things prophesied yet again in Scripture. And then he rose just as he said he would. And also by what we see in the book of Psalms, which Peter is going to address here in just a moment. So if you're here this morning and you've maybe you're familiar with, yeah, Jesus rose from the dead, whether you believe it or not, all the rest of those kind of things, you may have heard the story over and over and over again. I'm hoping that you're able to step back from it and, and also see it from God's perspective. He's done everything humanly and supernaturally possible that we would be left without a doubt that all of these things were done. And then let's remember once again, why were they done? This was not for the benefit of Jesus. I mean, he gave his life. None of this was of any benefit to him whatsoever. This was the cost of redemption. This is what sin had caused and that we could do nothing to fix that problem. Something was going to be done for us by someone who could, because we could not do these things ourselves. So as we see the effect of it, once again, I, I, I'm always reminded in the time of the early church, where Gamaliel had stood up and said, look, let's be really careful here, because here's the issue. If it turns out that this is a work of man. It will come to nothing just like all the other pretenders. But if this is of God, there is no way to stand in front of it. There's no way to get in front of it. There's no way to stop it. And so I always am reminded every time I read that, we are saying this and we are reading about events from a couple thousand years ago and yet here we are. How many would-be prophets and messiahs and saviors and all the rest have come and gone from the world scene? Many of them, we might know who they are. Many of them are lost to history. And yet, how many churches, whether they recognize it or not, are here only because of all of the things that he fulfilled? That's why we're still assembled. So, what was the effect on the early church? Let's turn to Acts chapter 2. Now, an important thing that happened before Jesus ascended into heaven. He had promised that he would send the Holy Spirit. Not only that the Holy Spirit could indwell the believer, that they could be born again, but that they would also receive a power or an empowering. Now, a lot of times that gets really bad publicity because so much of what we see represented in the church is just kind of a mockery. And it's, it's, a, it's a perversion of what was supposed to be this work supernaturally of the Holy Spirit. Well, here is the first time that we actually saw it take place. And this is when it had all begun. But notice here... As Jesus had instructed them in, in Luke's Gospel, chapter 24, starting at around, I think it's around verse 42, 43, 44, where Jesus says, you're going to go to Jerusalem. It's going to begin there. You're going to tell them that you've seen me, your eyewitnesses to my resurrection. You're going to tell them that there is forgiveness of sin by repentance. You're going to tell them this. And he gives them a, a list of things to make sure that they are careful that when they testify of him, that they cover these bits and pieces. So here we are at chapter 2 of the book of Acts and what happens. But as they wait on the Lord, then the Holy Spirit is sent to them. And we know the miraculous thing that happens. These select group of people begin to speak in a language that is not known to them, but it is known to the foreigners. Remember? The men that are listening to it saying, wait a minute, these guys are drunk. And then the reply was, well, how is it that you would come to that conclusion? It's the first thing in the morning. And more importantly, 
the people that are in from out of town said, how do these guys from Galilee know my language? How is it that they know how to speak in ways? And they're glorifying God, and it is not just the gibberish that a lot of times passed off as this work of the Spirit. And, and the message really doesn't ever seem to resonate. In this case, it certainly did. So in the fallout of this, Peter is able to stand up at verse 15. He says, the, uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 15, For these men are not drunk as you suppose, since it is the third hour of the day, but this is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel, that he was going to pour out his spirit upon all flesh. And it began at this time, and as he quotes from Joel, he says, this will continue until the day of the Lord, this work of the Holy Spirit. So then he goes on in verse 22. And notice the importance of this. Men of Israel, notice the elements in this. Men of Israel, Hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to by God, to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. So, of course, he says, God is the one who has attested to who this person is. How did he do it? Right there you see in verse 22, by wonders and signs, and miracles. Now, notice also there is an accountability that takes place because it says right there that he did through him in your midst. So the idea that there is this union between the Father and the Son. And here Peter gives this testimony, verse 23 tells us, and this Jesus, him being delivered by the determined purpose and the foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, you have crucified, and you have put him to death. So here's an important couple of things that are said in that verse as well. In the, the idea that he was delivered at a determined purpose. Well, that means that as much as man may have thought that they were in control, let's remember a few things. That when, as we looked at the beginning, there were those who plotted to take him, but never could because his hour had not yet come. You guys had plotted, but it was the determined work of God that made this take place. And when we get to it, and it'll take us some weeks, when we actually get to the arrest, remember it's John's gospel that tells us that when they came to arrest him, and they said, that, who is it that you seek? And they say that it's Jesus. And when he says, I am, or I am he, remember the, what happened to those guys? They fell backwards. They were knocked over, if you will. Who's in control? <laughs> Who's in control? All of these things were done by the deliberate purpose of God. Now that means that before the world was, that not only was this agreed upon, but this was the will of the Father and it was the obedience of the Son, as Paul tells us. That he became obedient even to the death of the cross in Philippians. The obedience even to the point of giving his life. And so verse 23, being delivered by the determined purpose and the foreknowledge. God already knew these things. You have taken, notice the responsibility, by lawless hands. There was no cause, which is, of course, that's, what's, that's what we're told in Isaiah 53 as we go through that. That there was, there was no fault in him. This was done on behalf of others. And Psalm 22 makes the same kinds of understanding. This was something that was done to someone because of the, the, the failures of others. He didn't need to do all of this because of his own sin. This was done for us. So, it tells us, you have taken him by lawless hands. And notice this, you have crucified he is making those people there responsible because crucifixion was a way of putting a person to death by the Romans, by the Gentiles, not the Jews. And remember that there was a time when Pilate said, you guys do with him as you will. And of course, their whole thing was, well, it's not for us to do that. We can't do that. We're under your rule. So it would be the Romans who would see to it how he was going to be put to death. But notice how Peter keeps them accountable. Yeah, the Romans may have been the ones to nail him to the cross, but you had an option here. You could have had Jesus or you could have had Barabbas. You chose the murderer instead of taking Jesus who was innocent. You crucified him and you used the Romans to do it. So that idea of trying to always put off on someone else our own actions, boy, he's holding them accountable for it. 
as we should also recognize that Jesus was put to death for the sin of all sinners, among whom we are. Yes? So if there was no one else needing redemption, any one of you in here, he would have done it just for you. If that was the cost of your redemption, he'd have paid that price. But he did so for all of mankind, for those that would call upon him. So notice it says, you took him by lawless hands, you crucified him, you put him to death. Now, I love the victory in this. Look at how he says in verse 24, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death. Why? Because it was not possible that he should be held by it. Awesome. Just amazing. So the idea that he was resurrected from the dead, again, all part of the plan. But I love the assurance of this where he says he could not be held by death. He could not be held by the grave. You put him to death. You consented. You used the Romans to do what you wanted to do. But God raised him from the dead. Why? Because it was not possible that he could be held by the bonds of death. And then he quotes this amazing thing. Now, I don't know about you. I love reading the Bible in a visual way. And there is this amazing psalm, Psalm 16, which Peter quotes from here. And this is one of those great, wonderful things about the scripture. You may read Psalm 16 on its own and say, I wonder what exactly it means. And if you're careful to study the word of God, you will find out that God somewhere else in the Bible will take those difficult, potential, difficult passages and explain it for you. And so Peter does so right here, empowered by the Holy Spirit. Notice what he says. He is quoting from Psalm 16 right here. I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore, my heart rejoiced. And my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope. And here is why. This is David writing Psalm 16. Peter, at the time of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit is sent, and everybody's trying to figure out what's going on, he says, this is what Joel said would take place. Now that we have settled that this is the work of the Holy Spirit that Jesus had talked about, let me explain the power behind the, the, the work that you see here. Jesus, again, verse 22, men of Israel, here, this Jesus of Nazareth, the one that you rejected, the one that you turned over to the Romans, you were responsible for him being put to death, but God would not leave him in that place. And so he goes on from that point to give an explanation for his statement by looking to Psalm 16. And then in verse 27, for you will not leave my soul in Hades, David speaking of himself. You won't leave me in the grave. When I go to Sheol in the, in the Hebrew, when I go to that place of the grave, you won't leave me there. Nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. So, we see in verse 29, men and brethren, let me speak freely to you about our patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn to him with an oath, that by the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. Going back to the promise that was made to him back in Samuel, 2 Samuel 7. An amazing thing that he is told these, these things would all take place. So here's what's important from that. He, Peter's able to say, you guys have read Psalm 16. That David knew that he wouldn't allow his body, David's body, to stay in the grave forever. But this holy one to see corruption, that is speaking of Jesus, that he, by only being in the grave for those three days, there was not the corruption. Actually, the third day was when he actually walked out of the grave. He did not corrupt. So you wouldn't let it stay forever. Now, I've always loved this. Again, visual. I love visual. In fact, as you're exiting today, I mentioned this, I think, on Friday. As you go out these doors, if you go down the hallway, right before you get to the double doors that go this way, take a look up to your right-hand side and you will see a first century tomb there in Jerusalem, attached to the same rock where you see Golgotha, where the crucifixion would have taken place. And what's really cool, when they close that at night, it's a door, and it closes from the inside, and there's this plaque on it that says, He is not here, for He is risen. Pretty cool. Phone's going off. Don't you love it, technology? So anyway... There's this plaque, and it said, He is not here, He is risen. Now, the door is open, and you'll see that there's even somebody standing in there, but the door itself, or the, the actual grave itself is there to be seen. 
So yeah, he was there for that time, but never seeing corruption. And you'll know that it's speaking of the of the uh, not allowing him to see or the holy one to see corruption. Um, it is speaking of Jesus. This is the holy one. David was not the holy one. So I think about this. We know from the book of Ephesians that it says that before Jesus ascended, that he descended into the lower parts and he took out those who were captive. So those people who had been awaiting him that could never go into the presence of God because there had not been a perfect sacrifice yet, now there was a perfect sacrifice. Jesus was able to take all of those who had died in faith and take them away. Can you imagine, David, when he finally sees Jesus face to face? He says, I knew this day was coming. I remember writing Psalm 16. This day was going to happen. And here you are. And actually, to consider that, that this is the same Jesus that he was the son promised to David, who would be that king forever. All of these things coming to pass all at the same time. So, as you consider this, I know we're all going to leave from here. We're going to go see our families, and we're going to spend all that time and all the rest of it. Remember the reason why we get together in the first place. It is easy to have that overshadowed by all of the events and all the things, but let's remember that there's a reason why all of this took place. It was the cost of redemption. Make sure that if you're one who believes that, remember that you have just an enormous amount of scripture that backs it up where God said that these things would take place. You can stand on the foundation of the word of God and know that it was told that it would be this way and Jesus did everything exactly as he was supposed to. That when you get a chance to talk with your family, that they could know that you don't just have some blind faith, but there are reasons why you can believe. And so as we take that time to consider it, let's put aside a little bit of time, even past now, to just consider all of these things and recognize that, yes, another year has come and gone as we await his return, but the promise is still there that wherever I am, that my servant, the person who believes, may be also. Is there an excitement in your heart when you consider that? Have you ever stopped to think that today could be that day? Is that a, a longed-for event or is it a fearful one when you think about it? Seeing God face to face? Is that terrifying or is it exhilarating? I can't wait. I want to see Him. He's the one who promised that where I am, you will be also. Let's stand. Now, the... Uh, Group's coming back up, and as we're dismissed, there will be people down here for prayer. And I know, again, it is a very common thing. On Easter, whatever you want to call it, Resurrection Day, people call it different things. We come to a place like this, and maybe it's not our normal thing on a Sunday morning. So if you're here this morning, and it's not the normal thing for you, and, and it's just something that you're expected to do... But maybe you've heard something that has resonated in your heart this morning and you recognize there's more to it than just religion. There's more to it than just showing up on a Sunday morning. But there is this accountability that comes from the Word of God when you see that He has spoken about something and that each of us has a response that is necessary. I would ask you that as we conclude this morning that you come down here that we might be able to pray with you. If there is uncertainty in your, in your heart and your mind, if you don't understand the reason for the resurrection or him being put to death and your responsibility for that, we want to talk with you. We want to make sure that if you need to cry out to him and seek him for forgiveness, that we give you the opportunity to do that. And that's just the beginning of all things. Then you start to grow and to know who he is, that there's a change that takes place in the believer. We want to be able to explain all of that so that you have everything that you need to make a wise decision.
In the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 15, Paul dedicates an entire chapter to the importance of resurrection. And he looks at it from a variety of angles, showing the importance of it. At verse 12 he says, Now, if Jesus is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how is it that some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? So he speaks to this church in, in Greece, in the south of Greece, saying to them, We've come and we've told you these things, so why is it that some of you are denying what it is? Now again, Paul's an eyewitness. He has seen the risen Savior. So he says in verse 16, he just reasons through it with them. He says, for if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. See, he shows how everything falls apart. If Jesus has not risen from the dead, he says, then also those who have died in him, they've perished. There's no coming back. If in this life only we have hope in Jesus, then we are of all men most pitied. So the idea that we would come to church week in and week out, if all of this is just a lie, what a pitiful bunch. And so Paul is able to say, but Jesus is risen from the dead. Just an absolute statement. And of course, if somebody would want to say, well, prove it, he gives you all the evidence in the first part of the chapter. Go ask the people that saw him. Go ask them. They're here. Check it out. Ask them. They've seen him face to face. So then he is able at the end, for, uh, for our understanding, verse 51 of chapter 15 in 1 Corinthians, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all die, but we will be changed. He says an amazing thing. I'm going to show you a mystery. Well, it's no longer a mystery because he explains it. In a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we will be changed. Same thing he says to the Thessalonians. He's speaking about the rapture of the church. And he says this. Here's the, here's the reason for all of this. This corruptible must put on incorruption, and this, this mortal must put on immortality. So then, this corruption, when it has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then it will be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. And then he asks this, I love this, O oh, death, where is your sting? Hades, where is your victory? Jesus has overcome. I love how it is that every sin that we could ever commit, it was a testimony against us. And there was nothing that we could do about it. The amazing thing, Paul talks about it in Colossians. It says he took all of those requirements, everything showing that we had failed, and he, Jesus, openly put it to shame, mockery, if you will, by nailing it to the cross for us. That is what today represents. And then he took his life back, resurrecting from the dead that you could have hope. Father, we thank you that you told these things in advance in vivid detail from the day that Jesus came into Jerusalem to the way that he died, when he died, why he died, and then also the resurrection, the victory that was won, the crushing defeat that was given to the devil that day, how death was put to death and the consequence of sin to those who would cry out. God, I pray for those who are here that have heard your word this morning who may just believe in Jesus in the historical or the religious sense, I'm asking, God, that you would open their eyes to the truth that he is the personal Savior, that those people that may not have ever cried out to him, responsible for the death that was done on their behalf, that they would join those who have come to you seeking forgiveness. We thank you, we give you praise, and we ask, Lord, that you would glorify yourself in the lives of each person here. May we live in that power of the resurrection of Jesus. We thank you. We give you praise. In Jesus' name. God bless you.